Let me say this. Questions surround our law enforcement officials in the DOJ and in the Secret Service. Uh, this is American Issues, take two. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel, and we have with us uh, Tim Apicella, my co-host, our regular contributor, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and our special guest, Chuck Crumpton. Thank you so much for being here, all of you guys. Good morning. Aloha. Aloha. Okay, so uh, let's let's take let's break this down um, first to uh, what's going on with the DOJ. So we find a couple of days ago, courtesy uh, Rachel Maddow, that in fact there was an internal memorandum in the Department of Justice uh, referring to a policy that William Barr, remember him, William Barr. Uh, had, um, you know, had told us about uh, in his time, I guess in December of 2020, um, indicating that the uh, Department of Justice should not and would not initiate any investigations of a, of a, of a candidate for president, which uh, actually uh, would work in Trump's favor. Um, and, and what happened uh, uh, it was this was, I guess, not made known to the public, but Rachel Maddow found out about it, and all oh, that caused a lot of consternation. Um, because we wondered why, um, at this point in time, when Trump is saying that he's going to run again, uh, that that uh, uh, this memo should exist, and further, why this refers to and um, continues a policy um, reflected uh, by the, by um, um, William Barr. Um, so let me go to you first, Tim. Uh, is there something really, really fishy about this, or is this just um, ordinary course of events? Well, I think that was a um, good morning. I think that was the motivation for Merrick Garland to get in front of the news, uh, the cameras yesterday and, and, and explicitly state that if there's a path of criminality, um, that memo doesn't hold. Yeah, OK, that's what he said. And then clearly that was um, a, a response to the news and Rachel Maddow and all the other Correct. media that pointed out uh, this, this was pretty shocking. Uh, also, um, uh, one of his uh, one of his uh, assistants, a woman named Monaco, um, uh, made similar statements. No, we'll we'll follow the facts wherever we go. Don't worry about us. Uh, Stephanie, are you worried? Yes, I'm worried. I I'm confused. I I think the AG is confused. We've got how many of these these discussions since since uh, since uh, the last. Uh, uh, the FBI person came out and, uh, and and spilt the beans on the investigations. It's it's clearly a confusion, even though they say there's memos and and there's uh, some semi pseudo policy, but the, I don't think there is. So I, I think we're uh, in jeopardy of um, bias taking over and pressure and threats. Does uh, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You know, Chuck, as a lawyer, you know, through your long career practicing law, you probably have had enormous respect and awe, not only for the Supreme Court, that's another show, but for the Department of Justice. Um, how do you feel about the Department of Justice now? And how do you feel about Merrick Garland now? Yeah. Well, it's amazing how quick the, you can go from one to two syllables from awe to awful. But... <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that decades of mediating has taught me is you look for what's missing. And in a society where too many people have been convinced to act and make decisions out of bias and fear and also the new BFF, right? That what's missing is that respect for a rule of law based on any kind of truth-oriented, objectively reliable information, decision-making, or action. It's just, it's gone. Yeah. Well, um, okay, we have, we have a, a kind of year and a half to look at Merrick Garland. Uh, and this show, um, as well as Tim's show, has um, frequently talked about mm, our disappointment with Merrick Garland. Um, and, um, you know, I, there's been a lot of um, uh, commentary written up in the newspapers about Merrick Garland, and uh, some people say, including my own self, that he's AWOL. 
um, that all the stuff is on his desk, but he doesn't do anything. And now we find that he makes these statements, but only under pressure. Um, I think the most interesting aspect of the memo in May was that uh, it, it admitted implication that he had not started an, an investigation of Trump. You know, we all wondered, and now that question has sort of been answered. He has not started an investigation on Trump. And frankly, the comments by Monaco and by him, you know, about in the future, how he will follow the breadcrumbs, also uh, imply that he has not actually started an investigation of Trump. So, uh, you know, what is going on with this attorney general? It is the most important issue, as you know, from your own two shows on our network. You know, this democracy is in trouble. And the one law enforcement officer we count on more than anyone else to preserve our democracy, to protect us from, from chaos, is the Attorney General of the United States. What kind of a job has he been doing? Well, one thing we probably should remember about Merrick Garland, he should be sitting on the Supreme Court. And he would have been with Chief Justice Roberts, the fifth vote to prevent the overturning of Roe versus Wade. The decision may still have gone in favor of Mississippi against Dobbs and Planned Parenthood, but maybe not the overruling. I have to remember, he's aware of that. If he's going to do this, he's going to do it once, he's going to do it right, and he's going to stick the landing if he does it at all. But before he does his figure skating move, he needs to be very sure, and he's a conservative, careful legal scholar that it's going to work. A lot of pieces have to be in place. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I wouldn't mind if he was on the Supreme Court. I think he's better suited for that than the role of attorney general. Uh, Tim, do we have time? Does Merrick Garland have time? go through this very careful conservative analysis, which has taken him a year and a half now since we saw the footage of the insurrection, since we saw Trump incite the insurrection, a year and a half and he hadn't done anything. Um, do we have the time? Well, if you're looking at it from a justice standpoint, the wheels of justice move very slowly. Uh, from a political standpoint, no. But from a justice standpoint, I'm sure in his mind, he thinks he does have time. Does he? I, think, I think what he did was he, he sat back and said, hey, if I'm going to take on, which has never been done before, if I'm going to take on the president of the United States for an, a criminal indictment, I've got to have a 98% chance that I swing the bat and I hit that ball. Not only hit the ball, but I knock it out of the park, to use a baseball analogy. And I think he thought, oh, there's going to be just um, superficial evidence that does not implicate Trump directly to the charges that I need to make. And if I can't direct, uh, directly involve him in that with evidence, then I'm not even gonna take up on the evidence. But until the hearing started to happen and you know people start paying attention to it, and I guarantee you he was paying attention to it, he goes, well, maybe there is an opportunity for direct involvement. And it's starting to look that way. So I think that's when he started to, to take note that maybe it's time to start the investigation in earnest. You have to remember also in March, I think it was March or April, he got on the airways and said, I will follow the breadcrumbs no matter where it leads to. Uh, so it wasn't just a recent announcement. He also made that announcement, I was it five months ago, six months ago? I'm myself, I'm getting tired of hearing these announcements. I want action. We have an election right. in November, uh, which could terminate the uh, select committee overnight. And uh, that'd be the end of that. And Trump gets away again. Um, so anyways, uh, Stephanie, let's let's go to you. How do you feel about it? Do we have time to let Merrick go through this very, 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 very careful process? Well, I, I, Merritt is the only one that has the time because the sixth committee is going to be over as soon as this election takes over the House. If it does, might not, but likely. So he's he's got the con going forward with it. And there is this this dilemma of whether not only a sitting president, but a candidate for president can be investigated and indicted. 
and why there's this confusion given the the, the severe issues that you know we we're grappling with now for years that there ought to be a, a you know a, a place of this if we're going to stick with the who is it the comey memo it's the memo in the doj there's a memo that you can't indict a sitting president and then by it follows that you can't indict the, the candidate either um is that really there who where is that memo no, that's an internal memo that's not necessarily the law that's an internal memo so uh, and he is respecting what william barr said which okay, who, I, who, do not, who do not feel that William Barr deserves our respect. He, he's a, he's fallen from grace for sure. No hero. Uh, no hero. So anyway, so I'm the DOJ point. intern that wrote that memo. No, I kid. I kid. But mm -hmm. yeah. it sounds like <laughs> probably. it. Probably. <laughs> probably it's true. But the, but the point is that, that there it's not at all for sure that he's in position or believes or is committed to doing that. Obviously, he's, we're, we're barely able to know if he's committed to doing the investigation, but I believe that he is because I believe that in, in Biden and him and that 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 he is a, a decent choice of Biden to be a G. Of course, that's really questionable, but he's in he's there and Biden's not going to be moving him out anytime soon. So yeah. we've got to understand that he's going to go with the rule of law and he's going to apply it, as he said to the president or the candidate for president because any, everybody's uh, under the rule of law. Nobody's off the hook, according to what I heard him say in his speech the other day. Yeah. So oh, that should talk, trump if, that memo. If uh, if you were the president, that's Biden. I want to be clear that the president is Biden. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you, and you saw this memo and you saw all this consternation among you know, all sides of the political spectrum about this memo and, and about uh, the abilities and tensions of the attorney general. And uh, you thought, gee, maybe, maybe I should pick up the phone. Maybe I should share my thoughts uh, with Merrick Garland. The key question is, what's his strategy? Which ducks does he really need to line up with the most reliability? Not just witnesses, not just evidence, but people within the DOJ system and people that can support the process and make it work in a way that even if certain courts or certain political entities are unreceptive, he can make a record that will have some judicial force. That's his experience, that's his training. So if I were in his seat, I'd be thinking of what's my team? What do we need to have? Who do I need to have on board? What kind of commitments do I need to have through the end of 2024? And what evidence and witnesses can we assemble that will get us there? But I rely more heavily on my team than on the witnesses and the evidence. We all know that Trump tried to overturn the election. Bannon has said it, Flynn has said it, Stone has said it. I mean, how many times do we need to hear it? Do we need to hear it from a 25 year old White House staffer as to how clearly they were aware of this. So what's Garland's strategy to make sure that when he does it once, he does it right, and the record will stick, whether he wins or not? Yeah, I think there's a lot of people out there who are tired of hearing that. You know, he's got to be very careful, and he's got to have all his ducks in a row, 99.9% .9 certainty of a conviction. We have tape. We, not only we have tape of the insurrection, we have we have tape of of the incitement, uh, and now we have a lot more evidence. And you're right, the 22 year olds don't count; they're the peanuts. Uh, he's got to go after the big boys, and he should be getting all kinds of uh, information now, and he should be sharing that with the committee. Um, but he's not really supporting the committee, not supporting those subpoenas either. So my question to you now, let me clear: I'm addressing this question to Kemp. <laughs> What is the problem in the Department of Justice? Is it, is it Merrick? Is it people around him? Uh, are there people that are Trump holdovers there that are influencing him? Uh, you know, he hasn't been a prosecutor in his career. Uh, maybe he just doesn't have the prosecutorial mentality to, to handle this. Uh, what's wrong in the Department of Justice? I think you just hit it up in the last note. I don't think he has the personality for it. 
a great personality for the Supreme Court. Uh, Completed, I mean, takes the time to think things out. But as far as one of those personalities to move quickly and look at uh, look at the playing field and say there is or there isn't a merit to uh, prosecute, I don't think that's in his wheelhouse. And and let's think of something else though. I mean, it was after January sixth that Merrick Garland was appointed as AG. Maybe President Biden didn't want to go down that road. I'm not saying he's the Gerald Ford of the Nixon administration. But maybe President Biden didn't want to spend his administration on the tumultuous uh, prosecution of a, a former sitting president. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And likewise, he doesn't want to spend the rest of his administration trying to get confirmation uh, of another attorney general. You know, he, could, he could ask Merrick to uh, resign already. Merrick is not popular um, and try to put somebody else in there. But he'd run into resistance. And he could spend a lot of time getting confirmation. Anyway, I'd like to I'd like to move to the next topic, if I may, uh, which in its own way is uh, even more interesting and, in fact, delicious. Uh, and it has it has a lot to do with uh, the Secret Service, Stephanie. Um, so, um, what what's going on with the Secret Service? Uh, have they got a legitimate position uh, in um, deleting all that email? Uh, in first saying they could get it back and now saying they can't get it back? Do they have a legitimate position uh, in saying this all connected to some routine maintenance of their, um, of their uh, what do you call it, text messaging system? Uh, what, what's, your, what's your nose tell you, Stephanie? The Secret Service is no SEAL Team 6. I am appalled. <laughs> I am appalled. You know, they're supposed to, you know, go down if they can't get it right. And uh, there there seems to me a red, huge red flag. And that, this might have something to do with Gardner, Gar, Gar, Gardner, the AG, because although he's not going to have much life after this administration, but it seeped so far, the corruption, the, the vile, the vile, um, eruption of all of this out of out of Trump, that he's unleashed these gorgons. And it's now seeping into every crevice, worse than Pelly taking over the Hawaiian island. Um, it's it's alarming. It's terrifying because that is and another institution bites the dust under Trump. And then it's the questions about the FBI follow through from that. All right, so we're there biting the dust too. So this is very, very serious. Mm -hmm. And uh, so and I'm, I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of it. And that's why I'd like to see some move from Mont Gar Garland. And I hope that he's only worried about that he can't get a jury or anybody to judge on it because the, the seepage is so bad that there's no person walking around DC that can serve to make a decent uh, you know, a verdict. I mean, this, I think it's just more signs of the mess we're in and the loss of our, what, virginity, loss of our innocence as a democratic republic. We're, we're, this is really, to me, another serious consideration. I hope this afternoon might give us some more info or hope. Let's see. Chuck, how do you connect the dots on this? Um, you know, because it's James Murray, who is still yet today, um, the director of the Secret Service was appointed by Trump. And we know from, you know, just a human observation that Trump tried to corrupt all the people around him. He tried to make the Secret Service his Secret Service mm -hmm. and loyal only to him. Um, was, was there a, an issue of loyalty here um, by James Murray or by the members of the Secret Service who are presumably still in those jobs? What, well, how do you connect the dots between Trump and what happened? Well, look at what we know. One, we know when you migrate data from one system to another, your first and foremost priority is backup. We could get Michael, our masterful tech, and ask him. And he would say, that's the first thing you do. We've all done it. I've done it with my system multiple times over the years. It's the first thing you do. In fact, you have multiple backups. 
in case the first one fails. Any engineer, including computer engineers, will tell you that. So we know that the awareness of the need for backup was there. Second, what's missing? January 5th and 6th text? Give me a break. That's not even close to a coincidence. That fools no one. The third, here's what's really appalling. And Stephanie's right on it. There is a complete disregard for the rule of law, whether it be subpoenas, whether it be legal process, whether it be legal compulsion, or any other kind, by all of the Trump allies. And they feel they can get away with it. And until somebody steps in, and your question about Merrick Garland is a good one, because until somebody steps in to enforce it, right now we're looking at the Attorney General of Georgia, not the Attorney General of the United States, to be the enforcer of the rule of law against the Trump foliation of evidence and disregard for it. Mm. Kim. You know, Jesus, this, can I how do you feel it? about this? Yeah. Yeah, let me let me tag team on to what Stephanie and Chuck has, has said. And let's go down the road path of history. Remember, Donald Trump asked James Comey, the head of the FBI, for his loyalty. That was one of his commands. If you want to continue to be uh, the director of the FBI, then loyalty is is kind of a prerequisite. Okay. So Joe Biden should have realized that that's what Trump demanded from his department heads, either in the DOJ or Secret Service, or let's not forget Louis DeJoy in the post office. Uh, I demand loyalty first, your, your mission second, your mission to the agency second. And to the country. And to the country. So what's the problem? The problem is with Joe Biden being so naive to think that you could keep these figureheads in those agency spots and they're somehow going to change the way they act and believe and behave. They're not interested in the rule of law or their, their oath to office. They were, they were dedicated to one thing and one thing only, and that's loyalty to Donald Trump, and they're still serving in that capacity. I'm sorry, but the Secret Service is nothing more than a willful destruction of evidence and certainly um, obstruction. Minimally, minimally. There's more to it than that. Uh, so what's wrong? It goes to Joe Biden for allowing them to stay as department heads in those agencies. I go to Joe Biden first. Yeah, well, that's, a, that's what my next question to Stephanie was. How does Joe Biden fare in, this, in the failure of the Department of Justice to do anything after a year and a half, uh, and in his failure to replace obvious um, Trumpers within his administration? He has the power. He had the power year and a half ago to replace James Murray in Secret Service. He didn't do it. Uh, he, he, I guess he didn't realize or didn't know or didn't care that Trump had established all these loyalty relationships with people in Biden's government. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what, you know, what, should, what should Biden do about this? And is, is this another nail in his presidential coffin? Well, I've just heard that the 36 years in the Senate is driving Joe Biden, and uh, and on that ride, he's he's developed this whole colle collegial, cooperative approach to everything, and that worked for many years, and that just does not work now. It's not working, and his his ratings ought to be informing him. And yes, I'm so sorry he has COVID, but it's mild. But he needs to get up off that sick bed and get busy with exactly what Tim says. I, I thoroughly agree. At this point, if he's uh, still waiting around for fealty, this he's asking for a two Brutus stuff. He's, I mean, it, it's going to be bloody. And, and and so it's so yes, Tim, I, I agree. And uh, Biden's going to have to. And where are his advisors? Speaking of all these people that are telling Trump what to do, where are Biden's advisors? Well, I'm going to give you an answer to that, Stephanie. We're, yeah, we're going to we're going to ask Chuck. We're going to ask Chuck. We're going to give <laughs> Chuck another free phone call. <laughs> this is your phone call to Joe Biden about you know the <laughs> apparent problems in his law enforcement organizations. Yes. Uh, and by the way, the Secret Service works for Homeland Security. So to the extent there's a, you know, there's a, oh. there's some problem uh, in the Secret Service that also opens the question about whether there's a problem. I think I already know the answer. 
in Homeland Security in general, which is so important to the country. Um, so, Chuck, um, here we are, dial tone, and, and there's Joe Biden on the phone. What's your advice? I think Stephanie nailed it on the head. One, he, he slept on leaving the Trumpers in positions of ability to do great harm, and now it's coming back on him. There are people in his administration that have the strength and the force to act. He's got a longtime former prosecutor as his vice president, and he's made absolutely no use or benefit of that throughout his time. Why would she not have been working with Merrick Garland to build this case and with the Attorney General of Georgia? They should be collaborating on evidence. They're going in the same direction. That's what I meant when I said earlier, he really needs to look at who are his most important people to line up and get his loyalty from, his commitment from to be able to accomplish what he needs to do, to make a record, whether he wins it or loses it, if he makes that record effectively, that's his best shot as a judicial officer, as the head of the DOJ. So it's the morning after, Tim. Uh, Chuck has had his call with Joe Biden, <laughs> and uh, Chuck has given him some real wisdom um, but the question is, what does Joe Biden actually do uh, to effectuate that wisdom, uh, to uh, correct the problems? Um, I mean, after all, he still has a year and a half in office, and there should be something he can do to alleviate this. He's losing popularity over, over so many things, including these two, what I call scandals, that are both happening around him right now. What, what uh, assuming that he accepts Chuck's advice, and I think he really should. He really should. Uh, what does he actually do? Um, let me give you that answer in various language. Yet, nada, nothing. <laughs> I'm gonna go with Stephanie's answer. And that is he is a creature of his Senate uh, environment. Doesn't have a mean bone in his body. He doesn't have any kind of uh, concept that Maybe someone's not acting in my best interest. So that's his naivete. Uh, and he's so scared, almost you know, a year and a half, two years into his presidency, that, my God, there might be political polarization. Oh, I, that was not what I wanted when I first became president. I wanted to sing Kumbaya and have everyone hold hands. Uh, and like Lincoln, I'll leave all these people in place. Uh, and you know, I'll be the next Abraham Lincoln to say I wasn't looking for um, uh, any kind of revenge or any kind of um, cleaning of house. Well, that was his mistake. And that okay, continues, what, what would you that tell continues him to be his mistake. Right now, what would you tell him? You know, he says, uh, you know, Tim, I, I have great regard for your action advice. What should I do today? Uh, Mr. President, in five minutes, I'll have a list of the various people in charge of your agencies, be it um, law enforcement or otherwise. We'll start with the post office. DeJoy, gone. Murray, gone. I mean, I would just give them a list and say, uh, call it a Saturday night, Saturday night slaughter special. I don't care what you call it. Get rid of them. They're not serving your interests. They're serving the former president's interests because of uh, political ideology, not, not loyalty to the mission of your administration. Stephanie, I noticed you've been shaking your head, and I wonder if that's a crick in your neck. <laughs> or whether you agree with Tim. I, I, I'm right on with uh, Tim here. We're just partners in the, on the horse ride here. I, I think that uh, he's got to unleash Kamala. Let's see what she can do. She hasn't done a damn thing yet. Excuse my French. But she's been uh, backed into something that's not working for her. So let's go, Kamala. Do it. Help out with this. The other thing is Tony Blinken. What a wonderful guy. But he's been a sidekick in Biden for 25 years, uh, one office away. And so I don't think Tony Blinken as Secretary of State is doing what he needs to do for, for Biden. Because, you know, here's, you know, usually you have these stellar people, and certainly Tony Blinken is a bright guy. I mean, but he's not got that edge, you know, uh, that, that we're looking for here to, to change the tack. 
course and start going after these idiots and taking care of business. Mm -hmm. So who else is there? But see, there's the question. Now, where are his these people that can take him uh, forward and help him break out of the 36 years of Kumbaya? And um, and let and let Kamala out. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't have confidence in her because you know I think she's a AG because I mean she's a vice president because she was a big friend of Bo's because he was a the AG of Rhode Island or Delaware and she was of California. They were doing a lot of stuff together. So I see him with more of a fatherly approach to her, a more father daughter. Uh, and I think he's lost. The benefit of her her killer instinct which is definitely there mm -hmm. so anyway there's he's got stuff he can tap into that chuck could be talking to him about now then there are other people you all may know the other people i mean already tim has mentioned uh, well some to fire but then where are these people that are going to give him the guidance to get to get on his horse and let's get on to the joust yeah, joust. yeah there are practical problems aren't there chuck I mean, if you took the advice of Tim and, and Stephanie on what Joe Biden should do, A, um, aside from the fact that he may not have the, what do you want to call it, uh, courage to do this, uh, the, you know, the background, the aggressiveness to do this, um, there are other issues. I mean, getting consent from the Senate on any, any official that needs consent is a problem. Finding somebody who'd be willing to do it, that might be an issue. Um, and finally, um, you know, pushback afterward, uh, criticism and attacks. Um, you know, this was a bad pick yet again. I mean, anything that GOP can do to criticize him, they will do. So, uh, and all of this plays into his decision process as to whether to do anything. But query, let's assume that he does this. Let's assume that he picks new people. Um, new people who are more loyal to him, may I use that term, um, and tries to get them into the, into the mix here. What happens? What are the risks for him? What are the things that might happen that would deter him from doing that? I think we need to think about what are the benefits, and those will show us what the risks are, but one of the benefits, if you get strong, aggressive leaders, <coughs> like Kamala, like the AGs of New York City or New York and Georgia, mm -hmm. like Cory Booker, others. Mm -hmm. there are people out there with that strength and that force and that training. Adam Schiff's a former prosecutor. He's got a lot of people available to him to move this thing in the right direction without his having to exert personal leadership. He needs to delegate. He needs to learn to do that. He doesn't have the leadership force or charisma to be able to do it himself. He needs to recognize that. He's got two and a half years. Give mm -hmm. him a shot. Mm -hmm. The risks, if it doesn't succeed 100%, to me are smaller than the benefits of giving strong, aggressive, bright, knowledgeable people the ability to take those risks, to pursue that path, and to see if they can make a change that makes a difference. Yeah. Well, Tim, let's suppose, just hypothetically, um, that uh, Merrick Garland did, did not accept the call and that Joe Biden did not accept the call. Let's assume for a moment, I know this is a ri ridiculous assumption, that neither of them watched this show with you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that Merrick continues his slow walk and Joe Biden continues his, um, you know, observer role, <laughs> if you will. Uh, what happens? This is uh, you know, the question out of uh, uh, Charles Dickens uh, and the Christmas Carol. Uh, you know, what happens going forward? Uh, what's, what's the dark side? Well, let's go to the point where Scrooge was at the gray side of his own grave. And that will be Joe Biden. He'll be flambéed. He'll go down in history as one of the, the most ineffectual uh, presidents of the United States. Uh, yeah, did he bring calm after Trump uh, left office? Not really, but he was a, he was a soothing um, personality for that. Uh, maybe that's his big claim to fame. That's not very good, I don't think, as president. But uh, let's look at the, the denial of justice and what the impact has on um, the perception of the United States as a nation of a rule of law. 
and uh, you know how the Constitution is is implemented fairly or hopefully fairly, uh, always progressing in that in that fashion and manner. But um, those are the two side effects that if they don't take the call, and you know Chuck said something that I just kind of, and it's true, Chuck. You said you may not have the you I think some like personality of the leadership to pull this off. My God, he's president of the United States, the most powerful leader in the world. <laughs> he better have the personality, <laughs> but he doesn't. And you're right, Chuck. He's got to delegate it to other people that have the personality. And what a sad statement that is. Maybe we need a college course called um, Leader of the Free World 101. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jay, it's called Civics 101. There you it is. Have it. <laughs> well, okay, it's time for wrap up, Stephanie. You go first. What are your closing thoughts here? Um, what, what would you like to leave with our listeners? Well, I would like to do the, the ringy ding ding of the bell of alarm because he also made the mistake of going to Saudi Arabia, and that is just unconscionable. Uh, so, I'm 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 just seeing a disarray here that is uh, he is still salvageable if these people, as Chuck mentions, and and Tim and I'm uh, sure like Cory Booker to get a ch get a chance at something here. This would be very good, and and others like that. And and what you're saying uh, is for him to look out at his stable and to start hooking up those ten horses on his chariot and get on with it because we're out of time. Out of time, out of time. And Chuck, uh, your last comments, and let me let me throw a question at you too. Is is it too late? Is this salvageable, or, or is Joe Biden and his administration toast? It doesn't matter. We've got two and a half years. If he's willing to let his strongest, best people, the best and the brightest, really <laughs> form their own team, form their own strategies, and go for it. That's our best chance. Yeah. Amen to that. Amen. Okay, Tim, you're, and, you're shaking your head. I assume you, you do not have a crick in your head. In your neck. Oh, no, it's Chuck and Hall. <laughs> no, that was, an amen. That was an amen to Chuck's uh, comment. And uh, that'll be my final word because we're out of time. But <laughs> yeah. Chuck's comment is my comment. And I think it's spot on. Let him out of the cage. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Very important discussion. Gee, I hope he does listen. And uh, you guys should make a call, you know, soon. Make sure the White make, House make those calls. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is Think Tech Hawaii. This is American Issues. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Tim and Chuck. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.